Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're still getting a few people joining us. Um, if you will just make sure that you are off video so we can only see our lovely panelists, I think that that will be the ticket here. And I'll give folks another minute or so to sign on. Okay, great. I'm going to keep the waiting room pulled up. So if we have any additional folks come in, I'll be able to let them in the door. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse Kelly. I'm the Government Affairs Manager for the Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties Policy Team at the R Street Institute. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, to discuss ways to support and rehabilitate youth charged with serious and violent offenses. Although only 5% of youth arrested are accused of violent crimes, there's little literature or tangible action plans discussing how best to serve these youth who are still being sent to outdated and ineffective youth prisons or being automatically transferred to the adult system. Today, we hope to offer recommendations on how to limit secure confinement and increase alternatives to detention so that the juvenile justice system benefits both children and the society to which they will return. Joining me today is Marcy Mistret. As CEO of the Campaign for Youth Justice, Marcy led this national initiative to an astounding win, created to end prosecution, sentencing, and incarceration of youth under 18 in the adult criminal justice system. The Campaign for Youth Justice dropped the number of youth in the adult system by more than 70% two federal laws and more than 100 state laws were passed by 40 states and the District of Columbia, making it more difficult to treat children as if they were adults. Her work at the Campaign for Youth Justice was recognized by the MacArthur Foundation's Models for Change and the Open Society Institute's Justice Roundtable. Trained in social work, Marcy began her career working in legal aid with court-involved youth with a focus on youth tried as adults. Next, Marcy worked as the Director for Training and Research at the Institute for Community Peace, a national fundraising collaborative focused on developing community-based responses to violence prevention. In her first local leadership position, Marcy became the founder, founding director of the DC Posse Foundation, a national college success and youth leadership program. Standing against racism and challenging power structures that perpetuate inequality have always been integral to advancing change. Marcy also was appointed to the DC Juvenile Justice Advocacy Group from 2000 to 2006, was an Open Society New Executive Fellow in 2015, and recently won the Board Leadership Award at the National Network for Returning Citizens in 2019. She is trained in social work from the University of Chicago's Social Service Administration. Adding depth and practical experience to our discussion will be Ashley Devon. Ashley is an accomplished policy director with effective leadership in the areas of public administration, physical management, equity, and public policy with extensive coalition management as well as partnership development experience across multidisciplinary areas. As a former educator, Ashley is an expert in the social and emotional development of youth, positive youth engagement, and restorative practices. Her professional portfolio spans government agencies like the Maryland State Department of Education, local edu educational agencies within Baltimore City Schools, and nonprofit organizations. Most recently, Ashley comes to Advocates for Children and Youth as a former restorative justice coordinator with the District of Columbia Public Schools. Ashley currently serves as the chair of the Maryland Youth Justice Coalition and as the co-chair of the Youth Diversion Work Group, Mayor's Office of the Children and Family Success in Baltimore City. Ashley is also a fundamental community organizer who worked in Baltimore to improve youth justice and community relationships. And over the past year, Ashley has been working specifically with Baltimore youth. As some of you may remember, last summer, a heightened police presence was necessary in Baltimore's Inner Harbor 
because large groups of young people were gathering and some fighting occurred. And that event was nationally reported by many media outlets. Uh, incredibly, the community rallied and provided opportunities for young people to refocus their energy and a remarkable outcome was achieved. Ashley, I'd love for you to give your opening statement by telling us about that event and all of the positive outcomes you've seen in the past year. Thank you so much, Jesse. And it's such an honor to be on this panel and to be able to, you know, kind of come behind Marcy, who is just incredible and so thankful for her mentorship and her leadership in the work and grateful to work with our street um, on all the youth justice initiatives in, in this state. Um, Memorial Day weekend of 2019, I just arrived in my position, um, just finished my first session in my position as Youth Justice um, Policy and Policy Associate at Advocates for Children and Youth. And um, what we saw during that weekend is about reports of three to 400 kids gone wild at the Baltimore Inner Harbor. There were uh, multiple victim reports, multiple police reports, and there that led to about six or seven youth arrests with the youngest arrest of a young person aged 11 years old. Um, what we did um, during that period was we, we not only looked at what occurred in the harbor, but we also looked at what was supposed to occur that weekend. Um, and it, it was ironic that there was supposed to be a large concert put on by the popular radio station here, but one of the celebrities um, could not come, so that concert was canceled. In Baltimore City, uh, we have approximately 120, roughly 120,000 young people under the ages of 24. And in Baltimore County, uh, Baltimore County Public Schools has roughly 120 just in their public school system uh, collectively. So the Baltimore metropolitan region is a large region for kids. And I'm gonna kind of preference this by talking in, in comparative analysis here. Baltimore City on average is, is ranked around the 26th to the 29th largest city in the country, but our population is similar to cities like Philadelphia, which is the fifth largest city in the country. Um, and when we do a comparative analysis of the 10 cities of the similar size and similar demographics, we see on average, Baltimore City has roughly 40,000 young people more than most cities. Um, and we do not have the same entertainment, economic opportunities and positive youth engagement that will provide resources to all those young people. So when an event that was planned for that demographic, the youth demographic was canceled, um, and it was, you know, because of where we are in the city, most people didn't even know that a youth event was supposed to occur that day and that young that left young people without something to do. So it was really centering and changing the narrative away from what violence and criminality existed among young people to really centering around what are they expected and supposed to do during these times. Um, and, and the second part of that was really doing a, um, a, a gap analysis to identify the times and periods in which the young people were had the most violence or had the most crime exhibited and identifying what resources existed during those time periods. Um, because I was able to look at that data, we were able, we shifted the narrative around what to expect for young people and what young people needed. And we saw a public private and governmental partnership happen where everyone really said, what can we do better for young people in the city? Um, I was able to work with um, Stand Up Baltimore, Green Mile West Community Center, the Liberty Reckon Tech Center, the, Ar the Algebra Project, and many other partners, um, including DTLR, T. Rowe Price, John Brothers, and, and Johns Hopkins. And we did a community initiative where we looked at the times and periods. Uh, we looked at the 10 weeks of summer on Friday and Saturday during the time periods when we had the most expected crime and added activations around where spaces that young people could go in and be safe make sure that we had economic opportunities for young people. And we wanted to make sure that there was positive youth engagement. We saw our um, acting, our mayor um, and our city council president allocate more funds to keep our youth centers open. So they, they issued the BALT initiative, which um, led to 11 rec centers having extended hours during those time periods. We also saw, saw many of our community partners donate funds to support community-based initiatives and events that would engage the population during that period. We came right back to the harbor. Um, we did multiple activations throughout the entire city, but we came back to the harbor of 4th of July, which is typically the time in which we have the most incidents of violence and crime amongst our youth population. And we saw no violence, no crime. And this was the, the, the uh, I mean, we had completely eliminated by doing intentional activation and working collectively as a team, we eliminated violence and crime during the time period which in which it was at its highest. Um, 
And we did a Just Chill initiative, and our focus was on putting trained individuals who can engage with youth in a positive manner in the places where young people would be, and also put using our peer-to-peer -peer models to make sure the young people had spaces where they felt safe, and if something was happening, they had someone that they could relate to. That initiative was incredibly successful, but I have to just take a pause and say that while I centered some of the research and the understanding of it, I could not have done that work if it was not for the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success standing up and understanding that this is what we needed, as well as many of our um, community-based partners, such as Ms. Keisha Webster and Mr. Derek Chase, who directly stood hand in hand with me and believed in me and also worked to bring many of our community partners to the table. And also, I just want to say that Mr. John Brothers from T. Rowe Price was critically um, important as well because he was able to center what does private business look like and how do we support initiatives of this magnitude. And so we saw by doing it, by doing by by moving from a reactive stance to a proactive um, posture that we were able to better meet the needs of kids and stop criminalizing our young people. Yeah, it's fantastic what you were able to do and what your coalition of, of people in that community were able to do. And I really, I'd, I'd also like you to highlight what happened um, even more recently when the youth led a protest in Baltimore. So it wasn't only that, you know, you, redu you saw a reduction in crime among young people, you actually saw activism be spurred by your outreach. Um, yeah, so the actually one year later, um, we saw some, a youth led protest um, in response to what occurred nationally. Um, the killing of, a, of an unarmed man by a police officer. And typically in a place like Baltimore, we know that this is this has always been a heightened social justice area. Um, when we look at many of our civil rights icons and many icons just from the black community with um, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and many others coming directly out of Baltimore, this has always been a place that has had a tremendous amount of social justice spirit. But we saw our young people channel that in a very positive way. And we saw a youth led protest occur with 15,000 participants that was completely nonviolent. Um, I do want to also give the caveat that I do not necessarily believe that the act of civil disobedience has to show up in a nonviolent way, but the fact that the young people chose that path and that's what they did um, and they were supported by community is an incredible uh, task. Just to say one year later, this is where we are. Uh, we do know that COVID has, has presented some other challenges for how we deal with crime and violence in our communities. And so while we have, we see positive gains in what we're doing collectively and holistically with our young people, we also still have a ways to go with, it, with really um, curbing the violent crime that exists in the city. Thank you so much. Uh, Marcy, I'd like to turn it to you for just your opening statement, and I'm hopeful that you could Give us a broader, more national perspective on some of the issues that Ashley touched on in Baltimore and maybe how some places across the country are working to help youth charged with violent offenses. Yeah, and, and I do wanna, um, thanks Jesse, and I wanna thank you for having me. And um, Ashley, I just think that, that those examples that you just gave really are just so important um, to this conversation because I think if we, when we always start with young people and addressing their um, needs, we see the possibilities open instead of um, instead of you know what we often term the risk. So I just really want to applaud you because that was an accomplished and continues to be a really really um, uh, something to celebrate. Uh, so hi everybody, um, I've met many of you. It's great to be here um, with my colleagues. Um, and I, I want to just kind of start with some a little bit of historical context here, right? Um, it has the portion of young people um, who have like we are at like the, the who have, who are engaged in any sort of violence is really just such a small percentage of the overall population of kids in the system. Um, we know this because we're involved in the system. We understand who these kids are. It is not, however, um, what we think is the most is what most people think, right? It's certainly not how the media covers um, mm -hmm. young people, and it and certainly and it's particularly not for young people of color. Um, and so I do want to just put a little bit of this violence piece in context. Uh, though we are working with perhaps one of the safest and most nonviolent generations of children that we've seen in mm -hmm. half of a century right now. Um, we, in the 1990s, you know, there absolutely was a spike in violence, not just for youth violence, for violence across the country. Um, and 
between then and now, the rate of, of young people's involvement in violent crime has dropped from 34 for every 100,000 people to eight. I mean, that is like a staggering drop. Um, and a lot of that has happened simultaneously with us looking at our youth justice systems comprehensively for us insisting on, you know, finding the research and insisting on um, uh, the development of a robust continuum of care. And I would say that folks on the statewide advisory groups, groups have been really instrumental in helping us get there um, by leveraging federal dollars as a way to do that. Uh, I just, uh, you know, young people, um, of the young people who are arrested and go to court, only about, as Jesse said earlier, between five and seven percent are for any sort of very serious violent crimes, right? I'm talking about murder, rape, uh, robbery, aggravated assault. Um, and the numbers have dropped significantly, right? In the 1990s, that was about 19 percent, right? Um, and what we have seen, because the youth justice system has adopted, uh, um, a, you know, a more developmental approach, we saw the National Academies of Science put out multiple reports about this. We know the Supreme Court has judged on this five times in the past 15 years. Um, and we know that states have rapidly been changing their approach to the way that they handle young people. Um, and I think we've seen the results for that, right? We have seen this drop in violence much more for the under 18 crew um, than for any of the other high risk like the 18 to 20 year olds or 21 to 24 year olds who are still part of that adolescent curve so i i want to just say like what we're doing <laughs> we need to just keep doing it and pushing that because where we are now is that we have allowed um, our interventions to benefit white children more than they are benefiting uh, black, Latino, uh, Asian, or indigenous kids. And, and so we, I, I wanna just posit here that we have a lot of the answers to these questions right now. It is a very small population of kids um, and, you know, and that we have been able to do this at a time where we have dropped incarceration by 55% for our young people. And as Jesse said at the beginning, we dropped the youth incarceration numbers while we were simultaneously bringing back tens of thousands of kids who had been excluded from the youth justice system because they were in the adult system. So adding mm -hmm. those adult, those kids who we treated like adults and implementing best practice and building out our supports and communities actually has led to drops in violence, drops in victimization, and drops in incarceration. So, and, and I would say, and drops in, in costs. So, so I'm really sitting here from a really hopeful moment and just encouraging us all to push a little bit harder and to challenge ourselves in terms of what our definitions, because our definitions of violence widened dramatically in the 1990s. And we have to go back and kind of rethink some of those pieces. Yeah, thank you. And you know, as all the attendees can see, and as you guys know, we entitled this discussion unpopular, right? Because at times it can be difficult to confront ways and have really frank discussions about how to effectively serve youth who have committed those violent or more serious crimes. So, you know, with that, we're going to jump right into some questions. And I hope that this can be a real conversation between the three of us. And, you know, attendees, please feel free to use the chat function. I'm happy to try to plug in any questions that you all may have. We want to be as effective as possible. So uh, thinking of youth charged with a serious or violent crime, what do you see as the most pressing problems justice involved youth are facing in our current system? Are you going to go in any particular order or does it matter? You can kick us off if you'd like. Um, there are so many things that, that are most immediate. And so I kind of just want to take a step back and say that I'm not from the youth justice, the traditional youth justice space. I'm a former educator. Um, and before I, you know, was an educator, I worked in, in, in political organizing and working with people. Um, and I worked in some of our more challenging school environments. And I think that we have a system in which we have attorneys, judges, and people who have law degrees making decisions about the behavioral um, modifications and rehabilitation of children. Um, I think that our system in Maryland, as, as well-intentioned as it may be, it has become a contractual system in which they are having to add programs in instead of a system that is centered on what are the best needs of children um, and centering the science around behavioral psychology and centering the science around 
what social and emotional supports are needed to begin to rehabilitate young people. I think if we first fundamentally start there and start at the fact that many of our justice models as it pertains to children are adult models that we have attempted to adapt to children and that they are not centered on youth, that presents a very challenging issue it, it, it off, off the base. The second component is that we have a huge legacy of racism. We can't talk about our justice system without talking about the racial ramifications of it and how young people began to get into this, enter into the system. Um, the campaign for youth justice during the youth justice, um, during YGM, Youth Justice Month of Action last year, their, their focus was on ending racism in the youth justice system. And some can argue, how can you end something that was you know, that was built on racist-based practice practices? So when we look at the data that shows overwhelmingly in the state of Maryland, 80 plus percent of young people that are in our system are African American. So it, it particularly brings us to focus on why are we failing one group of young people, or why are we forcing one group of young people to 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 face this detrimental um, fate. Absolutely. And I, I think you've, you've reframed that question really well, and it's speaking directly to the point and the heart of what we're trying to get to. Uh, Marcy, do you, have, do you have anything to add about what are the most pressing problems? Yeah, I think what Ashley just said was really profound in terms of, of the fact that we're using adult models. Um, and I'll say again, I feel like the youth justice system um, in many ways has uh, try to adjust that, um, you know, by using a developmental approach, by talking about trauma-centered and trauma-responsive care. Um, I think we're still at the nascent, the very front end of that, like the expansion of restorative practice, understanding that family systems interventions are the interventions that work best for kids. Um, and then, um, and then the other piece of that is to we have really stripped children of their childhood. Right. So we have criminalized childhood. We have excluded tens of thousands of kids for childhood behaviors and put them into the adult system. I'm talking mostly there about uh, the jurisdictional ages of childhood. Um, and then we don't let kids have due process. They're just automatically kids. All of those protections that we, you know, for whatever reason, 130 years ago, were smart enough to see we've kind of we lost our way for a period. And I think we're getting back to that. And then layer on top of it, of course, all those other vulnerabilities uh, with racism and um, and just our over -carc our carceral response overall is, is hugely problematic. But I also wanna say that um, I think Ashley also raised a really important point about the intersectionality here. The youth justice system can do all of the adjustments that it, you know, can, it, it can make as many adjustments as possible. And I think we have shrunk our footprint considerably and that should be applauded but there's a lot of intersectionality right so ashley talked about school to prison intersectionality but there's a lot there's child welfare um, that pushes kids into the juvenile justice system that hasn't necessarily adopted these um, approaches as robustly as we would like there are you know all of our policing strategies um, what is safety what is justice there those questions need to be answered um, and then just the um, treatment of young people while they're there. We know that big, even, and, and this is not an indictment on the people who work in deep end facilities, because I think there's been a lot of training and a lot of movements there. And because I work with kids in the adult system, I can see, I see those very, very clearly. Um, but we know that when we are putting kids that have no business, right? When we use that in parents patriae, when we are trying to keep a kid safe and we are incarcerating them we need to under we really need to use that not as a first tool but as the absolutely last resort in our interventions yeah thank you i'm gonna sort of i want to i yeah, wanted to add one i wanted to just add a piece that marcy mentioned um, I also want to add that nationally, when we look at data, we see that 90 percent of our kids in our youth justice system have, have experienced some form of adverse childhood experience. And so when we look at what is our definition of safety, because I think that is so incredibly important, that we have removed children or, or particular types of children out of that definition of safety. Um, I just I thought that was just really profound. Um, Marcy kind of highlighted that. Yeah, and, and really, I want to build off what both of you said. And I know, Ashley, that the advocates for children and youth have been exploring and discussing and 
bringing up the conversation about the adultification of children of color. And I wondered if you could tell me a little bit more about that initiative you guys are working on and how we can implement some of the changes that you're calling for. Sure. So I want to kind of just first would, would start with what is adultification? I don't know if we can share a graphic or not, um, but if we can't, it's okay. So um, adultification is essentially when we look at a child and assume their child is older than that person, than the child actually is. That becomes incredibly imp important when we're talking about children of color. I'm going to continue to center it around children of color because when we overwhelmingly look at the data, we know which kids are showing up here. Um, and Georgetown did a study on the adultification of girls. Other people have done studies on how boys are adultified. But I think that it's incredibly important to talk about this. We see that the, in the Georgetown study, um, our view of girls as being older than they are has led us to think that these kids need less nurturing, need less love, um, are more sexually experienced, tend to be more violent. And we have associated all of these attributes to their um, personality solely based on our um our view of those of those children uh, many times we you know i'm someone who's a, a big person i you know i have a tall father my nephew who is 14 years old is like six six and um and when some people see him they're going to see a grown man and they will treat him as a grown man and not allow him the same protections that they would extend to children or to someone else that uh, to another child who is 14 who may be smaller or may not have um, skin of that of a person of color. And so when we when we look at this phenomenon, we know that this phenomenon, where it comes from, how long it has been around, but it has really led to us not our unwillingness to protect certain children. And that and that has caused some very large desperate outcomes. So we know for girls, adultification has led to them being charged um, seven times, they're seven times more likely to receive harsher penalties than their racial counterparts. We know that the same, you know, the statistics are worse for boys, and I think it's almost 11% or something like that. And so the adultification has really led to us just choosing to remove the innocence and the childhood from a particular child solely based on the race that they're associated with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's not just um, after sort of there's been an intervention, it's right from the beginning, right? Because you're seeing uh, police officers entering into a situation, confronting a young person, and they also have that bias thinking that that person is older than they actually are. And so I think that conversation also, you know, necessarily has to include policing reform and how police officers interact with individuals when they're initiating some sort of stop or discussion with that person that you, you can't automatically assume things and that bias really has to be beaten back over and over again. Um, Marcy, have you seen in, in your national work how racial or ethnic disparities uh, present differently in the treatment of youth who are charged with serious and violent offenses? Um, so the answer to that is is a definite yes. Um, what I will say is, I mean, there is good news to report, right? When we opened in 2005, um, black, black boys were 10 times more likely to receive an adult sentence than their white counterparts. And of course, that, that, uh, that compares the underlying charge, the history of uh, delinquency, like it takes all those other factors out, right? So it's 10 times the number. That number now has dropped to about four times. And, but I wanna say it's dropped to four times because we've been able to shrink the number of kids there, right? Um, and, and what I will, I think what's really important to point out here is, is again, those off ramps, right? Um, it is that initial point of contact. How is violence defined? The school resource officers we've seen during COVID right? The number of kids who dropped in terms of their contact with detention was down 27% during those early months when kids were out of school, they were home, there was a lot of stay at home orders. Well, as those, as those loosened up and kids went back to school in person, we saw all of a sudden that number go up again. Um, and if that's not a correlation, again, in communities that are more likely to have school resource officers that are more likely to make those referrals, definitely tend to be more black and brown places. So um, we have to really think about that because if violence was dropped in those two months, by, I mean, if uh, arrests were dropped and referrals were dropped and detention was dropped by 27%, and I want to note that that 27% drop in those eight weeks was the same percentage that we've seen over the 15 years of us trying with JDAI and other initiatives. 
So there's still room to push and shrink this here. And I think that um, we just need to be strategic about how we're doing it. Um, and we need to believe that there's a lot of values um, and bias and, and straight up racism in terms of you know, family beliefs that families don't want to be engaged, that families uh, are sick of their kids. Uh, we're still telling families that the way to get services is to get kids arrested. And those don't, those aren't universal truths. <laughs> They're targeted truths. Yeah. Yeah, I want to um, shift the conversation a little bit. And, you know, Jeff, thank you so much for your question in the comments. It's actually one that I have on my list to cover as well. So we'll shift a little bit. Um, violent youth crime can often be explained by contextual factors in a young person's personal history with victimization. Uh, how should this impact how the justice system responds to youth? And what are some alternatives to detention that we can build in? I can jump in on that because I wrote an entire report on it. Um, so you guys already have those tools. A lot of this is, um, again, and I see this all the time as we're getting kids back from adult facilities. Um, I'm going to say if you have a, if you're working in a jurisdiction and we all know that JJDPA is requiring us now to get kids, even those certified as adults out of adult jails. Um, and I will say, and I know my, my allies from, and my partners from many of the places that have done this, New York and DC and Virginia, um, that North Carolina, that, um, if kids touch the adult system and then come back to the youth justice system, you're going to see some pretty significant trauma and boundary testing. Um, and and um, what I what I will say is after that um, initial adjustment period, you know, kids quick kids are quick learners. Um, that if we really do adopt a, a trauma informed and a, and a healing approach to our interactions with those young people. Um, we can really have huge outcomes and positive outcomes. Um, we had a lot of discussion with the deep end, uh, with, with folks that um, have evidence-based practice. So MST, FFT, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, anger replacement therapy. Those, all of those services were, and, and interventions were designed to work with kids with high trauma, high need, um, and, and experiences with violence. And what happened is in the 1990s, we started a broad app, or maybe not that far back, because I don't know that all of them have been around that long, but we started to apply those to much lower risk kids. Um, and there is, if you go to any one of those places, you will see that they are effective with exactly this population. That's one. The second thing is, I think there is fear that the kids that are in the adult system are quote unquote, the worst of the worst. Well the kids in the adult system are making up much more than that five to 7% that we know of kids who engage in violence. So we haven't narrowed that at all in a way um, for kids. You know, we're, we're still sending way more kids to the adult system than that category of kids that fall under the unified crime report for very serious and violent pieces. So that needs to be shrunk further. And if we're able to shrink all of, and then the third thing I wanna say is that these community-based interventions, those MST, FFT, CBT, et cetera, et cetera, and, and not evidence-based practice, I wanna say there's a lot of culturally competent programs that don't have the money to do the research to become evidence-based that are just as effective, um, are just as effective in the community as they are in deep end, in deep end facilities. So there's really a reckoning there. And I would argue if we can shrink that number to a more appropriate, because there are some kids I'm, you know, I want to get to a place where we can be abolitionists in our actions as well as our thinking. But I, there are kids that we have not invested enough in prevention and in, in all of those ACEs pieces and that front end. If the first time a child was exposed to violence or witnessed violence or was impacted by violence, they had services wrapped around them. I think we would shrink this to a negligible number um, First of all, so we need way more money and resources put into that end. And, but I would say at this point, the deep end folks, when I'm talking to folks that are working in detention and youth prisons, they are saying these kids are incredibly complicated. They have so much trauma, so much trauma, and they have dual diagnosis. So they're oftentimes severely 
um, mental, they have severe mental illness or behavioral problems, or so, or co or students who or have disability, learning disabilities, learning disabilities. Thank you, Ashley. And they get that, and that in and of itself locks those kids out of a lot of therapeutic programming. Mm -hmm. And if we shrunk it enough, I think that we could actually use the resources that we did commit to really being therapeutic and model and not being so carceral in nature. And I think that that would fix it. I think Marcy adequately covered that. And I just want to say, she mentioned a few different models. Those models exist in Baltimore. But what we see is the issue is, is the issue is not, do we have models that work for these kids? The issue is, is, the issue is, do we have these models in every jurisdiction and every youth facility so that every young person has access to them? So what is the equitable um, um, availability of those resources? And I, I just want to be very clear, too, in, in the state of Maryland, we have 33 exclusionary offenses in which a young person can be charged as an adult. We do not see the same level of interventions placed in the adult system that we see in the Department of Juvenile Services. So by having the young people stay in the adult system, it then limits our ability to rehabilitate their behavior. We have approached um, our, our youth justice and our, our really our criminal justice in a way in which we, we, we've said that it's okay to throw th certain people away. We have to really kind of walk that back and say that everyone has to re-enter society at some point and so, to some degree, and we can't just, you know, lock them up in a room. We have to use the appropriate services and put them in the appropriate system so that they can get what is necessary so they can re-enter society in the, in the, in the appropriate way. Um, in addition to making sure that we have an equitable availability of those programs throughout the state, and I'm talking from Eastern Shore over to Southern Maryland, and not just in Baltimore County or Baltimore City and the more affluent areas. Uh, we also need to make sure we have tiered intervention programs on the front end. Programs, um, we need community-based programs that can support low-level offenses and nonviolent or, or um, nonviolent misdemeanors and things of that nature. But we also need tiered interventions, tiered evidence-based and culturally competent interventions that also center um, that are also gender responsive, and that is a large um, area that has been left out of this. And many times we have interventions or systems that work, but they're not gender responsive or they're not culturally competent. And so that leaves a lot to be, leaves a lot to be desired on the table. The second component of this is that we, I mean, when I worked in education, we had a triad system of how we approach things. And that triad understanding of, of how um, social services and other components come together to meet the needs of the child must be approached at all components of children who touch the youth justice system. It is not just appropriate for us to say like a, this, we, which is very interesting in this state, we have the Juvenile Justice Reform Council, which is evaluating the reforms that needs to take place in juvenile justice in, in Maryland. But on that, we see the, the state's attorney's representative, uh, Mr. Schellenberg is saying, well, don't you see kids, we, you can tell what direction this is headed and you can almost say this kid will be better served by being locked up. We have to change that philosophy and understand that kids are not better served by being incarcerated. And if a young person has a need that is not being met, incarcerating that young person is not the way to meet the need. Let's identify the outside support, be it in the Department of Health and Human Services, be it in child welfare and meet the needs of that family while also meeting the individual behavioral needs um, of the child through the intervention programs that we know that work. And I would also say that um, last legislative session, we saw um, a bill for funding for violence intervention based programs be vetoed by our governor. Mm -hmm. This is the funding that, give, that gives programs like Safe Streets and ROCA funding to be able to provide those front end supports for our violent offenders and to begin to work with them so they can success successfully re enter in community. Um, Marcy started with something that happened in the 90s where she wasn't in. I was born in 85, came out of high school in 2003. I remember the first time coming back home my sophomore or freshman year in college and everybody who did not go um, to college was locked up or incarcerated. Um, and so she's essentially describing the work that she did during my matriculation into adulthood. And what we see is that there have been investments here. Then we see the investments move an investment here, then the investment move. We have to have consistent funding so that we can have consistent programming to meet the needs of young people. We can't begin to move the needle and rip the funding and supports away and not adequately fund the program. And the other component Marcy said, I think is very important is that when we talk about what is evidence-based, we have to talk about there has, there has consistently been a misalignment from community and system. And so the programs that many people will recognize 
as this is what works. Um, Reverend Mar Marvin McKestry is a board member of Advocates for Children and Youth, and he is also someone who went to, um, who, who was a youth defender for a very violent offense. And he describes what made the change in his life. And I think that's a video Jesse will send out later, later as a follow-up. But he talked about him being engaged in his church or faith-based community made the difference. He adequately described in um, an event in which he could have chosen violence or criminality. And he said, this is what made the change. And I finally realized that I was changed. It wasn't because of a, a Department of Juvenile Services evidence-based program. It was a local institution in his community that he got positive engagement from. And so we also cannot minimize the impact of what front end supports need to be in the community. And when we see the levels of violence and when we see the levels of crime showing up, they're, they're typically coming from communities that have had historic disenfranchisement. And so if we have not invested in them on the front end, we want to then subs subsidize that trauma and poverty on the back end by incarcerating those young people. And that's not okay. So I think that making sure that we have an equitable amount of services throughout the state and making sure that they are all service are culturally competent, gender responsive and evidence-based will change the landscape and begin to drive down the numbers as Marcy so said, so we can have a true understanding of who is actually committing violent crime. And if, our, and if we are really looking at the full catchment that we currently see of who is, who is committing violent crime, we have to do something different as a society and say, why are we breeding criminals and violent offenders? What in our community is breeding this? And we have to then have a different conversation about what does it mean to then go, into, go and become a restorative community? Um, and, and, and I think that it, some of it has to be both, right? But if most immediately, what, what are the individual needs? How do we meet the individual needs of kids? It's through the things that Marcy laid out. But the other part of that, we can't, if, if all we are creating amongst our youth population are people who commit serious offenses, we have to really reevaluate as a society and as a community what we're promoting. Thank you so much. Um, great. And I'll, I'll highlight for our attendees, I know some of you joined uh, a little later on, please feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat and we will incorporate those into our conversation. So now I'd like to turn to a question from Mark. He asked, how do you explain and gain support of elected judges and DAs? Into the adult system. Um, you know, and, and I'll sort of kick it off um, and, and allow you guys a moment to rest your voices and think. So I practiced criminal defense work in Alabama before I moved up to D.C. and started working on policy. And for me, it was important when I was representing uh, young people to really humanize them and especially for the victim, because uh, oftentimes a victim will only see the crime and will fail to see the whole person. And so for me, that was very persuasive. And then in turn, once you have uh, the victim of, of a property or of a violent crime uh, bought in to what that young person needs, that's going to be your best advocate to persuade a prosecutor to change their mind about how they're going to pursue justice in that case. Uh, and then whichever one of you would like to add. Go ahead. I think we went you to talk to at the same time. Go ahead, no, Marcy. Ahead, Ashley. You go ahead. No, no, no. I think they, they asked directly, like, Marcy, what would you do? So I oh, don't they did. And Marcy's okay. my mentor as well, so, you know. So, so I'm, <laughs> I'm dropping things in the box. Excuse me for um, just continuing to put reports um, reports on you. But the first one is um, the Youth Justice Reimagined out of LA County. And um, I don't know if I have any folks from California here, but I, I really encourage you guys to watch, to, to look at that report. Um, it, it's like hot off the press from the Burns Institute. There's been a lot of reform going on in Los Angeles, including the very recent, like two weeks ago, um, election of a progressive DA there that had come from San Francisco. So um, I think um, I think that when people, we got to remember, when people get access to knowledge and tools, it can change their thinking, right? So we're asking, like, how can we get DAs and judges? We've got to take the time to train them and educate them. Public defenders get a lot of training on racial and ethnic disparities, on seeing the whole child, on all of those mitigation things, right? That's their job. We have found when we start, and I've gone to rooms full of DAs, and I'm like, how many of you, and judges, how many of you have been to the facilities that you're sending these kids? How many of you have walked inside a youthful offender 
uh, unit on an adult jail versus what you guys have in detention. How many, like, and so they don't, they don't have the information. A lot of, a lot of time I have to say, it's not about information. Or they'll wash their hands clean of it and be like, well, the kid waived his rights, it's out of my jurisdiction, right? Um, and, and that's another thing that I just feel like we have to really push to get to the answers to these questions, which I, is why I think um, the policy work is so important, right? The, the, and I'll say that because you can really start to change once you get people and, you know, uh, Brian Stevenson talks about being proximate. You guys that work with these young people and families and are on the ground with them are proximate. You understand these nuances, right? As soon as we get a group of kids from the adult system back to the juvenile justice system, my phone rings from the head of that facility or from a case manager from that facility and like, these kids are being railroaded, like they're shocked, right? I was like, gosh, I guess my messaging isn't that clear. Um, but but it's like, until you, it's in front of you, you can't understand it. So we, it, I do call on all of us to be those advocates, those voices, to get those young people to directly speak to policymakers. Um, and I can say that that's a radical, tra and not only to, to, to policymakers, but also to victims' rights groups. Um, that second piece that I put in there in terms of from the Justice Policy Institute, they met with the National Center on Victims of Crimes. They, they ran focus groups across the country. Um, the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth does this all of the time in terms of talking about kids who are, have been sentenced to juvenile life without parole, which is highly correlated with murder convictions, right? P perhaps the most diffi difficult violent crime that we talk about here. Um, and what people found is that what the victims are not, first of all, not a homogenous group, so don't let DAs have that narrative. It's not accurate. What they want is treatment and service to, to make sure that that violence doesn't happen to anyone else, right? So they, that is the accountability they want. They want the work. They want, and it's a lot of hard work for these young people and families to heal their own wounds, to heal their own trauma, and do that for for us to not accept that as an appropriate intervention and accountability structure is is really problematic. Yeah, and oh, I would add color. Sorry, Ashley. No, I would plug this little piece into, and then I'll definitely turn back to you. Um, I think what we also should incorporate in this conversation is the growth of restorative justice, what that looks like, what it means for a young person who's committed a crime and the person the crime was committed against, and also how can that be a tool uh, without increasing more harm? Uh, so if you could incorporate some thoughts on restorative justice too, I would be really appreciative. Oh, okay, so I wanted to just highlight the work of the Maryland Violence Prevention Coalition um, and and what they have, what you know, our what that coalition has attempted to do. We have identified legislators and judges and prosecutors, and we've invited. Well, the coalition has invited them to come on a tour, to visit the services and visit the programs that are working with the young people, to speak with the families and speak directly with the young people. I think Marcy's larger um, sentiment was build relationships, and through relationships, we be we can begin to educate. Um, most people will not. If, if people don't know you and they don't respect you or you don't come from their community, many times they won't begin to listen to you. And we often come, come with our, our advocacy points, not understanding that we have to build relationships first. And so this is, I mean, the, the comment is very much so grounded in what does organizing look like and how do you organize from your position of advocacy? Um, and that is building um, building in coalitions that center the voices of directly impacted people that make sure that you have adequate um, representatives who, who work in all entry points of the justice system, and then also making sure that you have ad, um, adequate ad, advocates who are in place to begin to have those conversations. Um, I'm really grateful that um, we have the Juvenile Justice Reform Council because it allows individuals who would not necessarily have had conversations in an open and public forum to discuss what reforms can be done. And in many other states, you have coordinating um, criminal justice councils. Those are great places in which we can begin to break down the silos. Um, and it's important for a place like Maryland. Maryland is, is some people will call it a blue state. Most people would look at it as a purple state, but it is a state that, is, that, is, that has a Democrat um, dominated legislative body. And we are, our fight here is not against, you know, in some regards, the racist sentiments or 
um, very far leaning Republicans. It is about how do we move moderates and conservatives to understand our points and what is best for our young people. And the only way that you can begin to do that is to raise their level of understanding and continuously show them what the reality is of the decisions that they are making. Um, and I don't, I just don't think that you can get around that component. Um, my child welfare policy director, we did a racial equity training um, a few months ago, and this was, it was, it's, for me, it was a really great moment. This, there was a judge who had, you know, ruled over many cases and had gone through a lot of uh, racial equity training, but she had, she acknowledged that there was an aha moment in the racial equity training that she just, this this other iteration of it that she went through and she just did not understand before that moment exactly what points um, you know advocates were trying to get her to understand and the only way we can begin to move people is to educate educate and educate and then organize 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 um, and and our hope is that and we, our hope is that as we begin to talk and we open up lines of communication with individuals, that we we uh, we attract their sensibility and their humanness, and we can get them to understand um, different points. And and I have to be very honest um, with organizing. I have to be clear that I may not be the credible messenger for everyone. There are some individuals when I come in the door, they may not listen to me solely because of the way I look, the way I talk, or where I live. And so it is about building intentional cross-racial alliances. It is about in building intentional relationships with various components, various individuals. So I would need to be someone who was able to talk to the, the person who has had the direct experience and the person passing the judgment. But we have to build and go in coalition. And there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you have to go together. Uh, we started this by talking about this initiative that I did in Baltimore. But before I started that initiative, I called Marcy and Brian to talk about, I got a crazy idea. What do you think? And because I was able to coalesce with individuals who had more knowledge base than I did, they were able to help coach me and help me navigate how to do something of that, that, that monument, right? And so I think coalition and going together makes a lot of sense. Definitely. Ashley, a quick question from the audience, from Sandra. Uh, do you remember what that judge's aha moment was? Um, I don't remember, but it was it was really it was grounded in racial equity and, and how racial um, and how those in, intrinsic views of individuals can lead to different placement plans and different judgments. And Thank I don't you. think that I, I don't think that that judge had ever confronted their bias in that way. Right. It was a new experience for them, and that was what brought to light some of that. Great. Jessica, so can I, I, can yeah, I go ahead, Marcy, please. One thing I see Peter asked about, and that North Carolina is trying to bring more RJ components of the facility. Um, so, first of all, I want to say, Peter, I could applaud you guys. I think that that's the direction we have to move in. Um, I do want you to talk to folks around some of the slippery slopes around that. There's a couple things. Um, and I know I've talked to folks in DC and in California about this explicitly. Um, it is really important that if you're gonna set up circles that your, whatever the like um, uh, system, like whatever your levels are also aligns with that restorative practice. What we have found in some places is that, you know, a young person and maybe a staff person or two young people will go through a restorative practice and they'll feel healed but a week later, that administrative a hammer will still come down, which undoes every single thing that you just went through in the circle. So I just want to point that out to folks. And then the other thing I want to do is to say that the, a really important part of restorative practice is that the person who has been harmed um, is going is ready to do this and open to doing this, as well as the person who committed the harm. Um, there are some of our kids that are still in pretty active trauma that are not going to be able to see the other side um, in that moment. So it might take a little bit of time to get the, there might be pre-work for some of these more serious um, uh, cases of kids with multiple layers of trauma to get them to that point. So I just wanna, um, I just wanna flag that. And I'll say the same is true with credible messengers. I think that, um, Ashley articulated this really quickly, but we have got to invest in the supports 
Uh, just like we invest in supports for our, um, the folks that work in our facilities or in probation if they've seen trauma, the same is true of our credible messengers. They are um, exposed to a lot of trauma and it can be very triggering for them in their own childhood. Um, and we need systems in place to make sure that they get the supports that they need in order to continue doing the work that they do. So I just want to say that before, I don't want to skip that, it's important. I wanted Thank to you. kind of piggyback on what Marcy was saying there. Um, and just really, I want to I want to go into restorative practices and restorative justice and talk about that for a little while. Um, people have this understanding that restorative practices and restorative justice is the white hat. This is the big thing that is going to change everything. Um, and while it's possible, it could, but we don't have a realistic understanding of what that time frame looks like for change and what does it look like to to shift culture and climate. And what exact what is the difference in restorative practices versus restorative justice? Um, and if I just do a circle, am I now restorative? And I just would like to caution, similar to what Marcy put forth, a circle is, does not mean that you are now restorative. Restorative practices um, are everything from speech to how we engage with each other to how we resolve and deal with any level of conflict to also the formalized components of a circle. Um, and in many school environments, I, you know, you see this play out the most, right? And that we say, we're going to just do restorative, whatever. This kid did this thing here, lady, come do your little circle trick with the kid and make the kid not do something anymore. That's not how that works. I can't begin to tell you the amount of time in which I've had serious, serious conflict. Um, uh, just an example, when I was in Southeast DC, we had an, you know, a, a brawl in front of our school, a brawl, I mean, that led, that, that ended in shooting. And the next day they said, let's do the circle with these young people. I said, Wait, you know, and I'm trying to sit in this middle of the circle. I'm like, this is not time. We can't do this yet. And the young people are ready to fight. The family members are ready to fight. Being restorative and doing this work is not a magic trick there. And, and that's the largest hurdle with dealing with young people um, in the deep end who are dealing with serious, um, dealing with uh, 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 serious offenses is that we want something that's going to work like this. And that's just really not how that work, that work happens. It is continuous things that must be done on, uh, on, on over a time period. And we build in and layer in and work to higher levels in what restorative practices look like. But uh, it is not something that we can just flip a switch and it will work. Um, I need to change the way in which I engage with people. I need to understand, even if I am someone working with a young person, what is a non-contingent praise? Um, what is contingent talk? What is non-contingent talk? How do I engage? How do I build a personal relationship? And, and there are just a lot of components of it. And I just want to just, I just want to give that warning <laughs> because I think we approach the work in that way. And that just really is not how the work shows up and how we get results in the work. Perfect. Um... Great, and thank, thank you all so, yes. so much. P Peter's comment, I was reading it too. Yes, yes it, is, exactly. it is in fact a cultural shift, it, it exactly is. And we know that in, um, we have less research around what a culture shift, what a culture shift looks like in, in a large department such as the, the Department of Juvenile Services or the Criminal Justice Department and more research around how to transform a school environment, a school environment, a very small school environment will take three to five years to shift that culture if we if we institute restorative practices. So if you're talking about a larger departmental shift, we're going to be somewhere around that four to five year time frame. And that is going to be a complete retraining and re-understanding and, and a different approach by all members who exist inside of that department. So it is a cultural shift. I'm sorry, um just no that I think that is a perfect conclusion um, to our to our hour together. I know that the three of us could go on and on. And I just want to thank everyone who chose to sign on to our session today. And please know that we are all very open to questions and welcome having additional conversations. Feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. Marcy, Ashley, thank you. Thank you for all the work you continue to do. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you all. Bye.